Hola a todos. Okay, so we have the Mexican Revolution. Um, today is the 110th anniversary of the Mexican Revolution, so. If you remember back to La Llorona, the story of the weeping woman, um, you had this pyramid. So what does this pyramid represent? If peninsula is criollos, mestizos, mulatos, africanos, e indios. Okay. So if you remember peninsulares are people from Spain who are, came here. Criollos are people who were raised here but still have a tie back to Spain. Mestizos or mulatos are mixed people. Um, either like like Spanish mixed with Africans or Spanish mixed with Indians. Um, and then Africanos and Indios are Africans and okay. Now, that's important because back then <clears throat> you had peninsulares being the top and that's the hierarchy. So if you look here, I changed it around. What do you think being bigger means? Got bigger means like the population is bigger. So in 1910, the biggest populations were of mestizos or mulatos, the mixed people. Okay, Peninsula is made up a very small portion of the population. Crio is made a little bit bigger, but still small. Mestizos and mulatos were the biggest group. And then Africanos and Indios were still a fairly large group, but uh, not as large as mestizos and mulatos. So here's some causes of the Mexican Revolution. You have Porfirio Diaz, who was the president. He was a dictator. Um, he helped modernize Mexico with railroads and things like that. He suppressed a lot of people. Um, working class wages went down while he was the president. Um, and 95% of the rural population didn't own any land. So basically, if you lived out in the country, you own no land. Um, who do you think lived in the rural areas? Which people? The Peninsula, the Criollos? the mestizos or the indios. You've got it, the mestizos and the indios were the biggest group that lived out in the rural areas. And the mestizo population grew really big after 1850, which is why it's so big by 1910. So here's the start of the revolution. Uh, you have a guy named Francisco Madero who ran against Diaz to become president. Diaz had Madero arrested on election day um, so I guess to put this in modern context, the only two presidents that were incumbents who ran for president while y'all been alive have been Obama and Trump. It'd be like if Obama locked up McCain or if Trump locked up Biden when they had the elections. Um, so basically Diaz was making sure that he was going to win. So he locked up his opponent. Um, Madero called for Diaz to be overthrown. He called for revolt, revolution. And the movement was supported by the peasants in the middle class, basically by your indios, your africanos, and your mestizos and mulatos. And then I want you to think, like, why would they support this movement? You've got it. If you remember back from the last slide, um, Diaz didn't allow them to own land, and he suppressed their wages. He declined their wages. So if you aren't getting paid and you don't have any land, you're going to be mad and you're going to want something to be done. Okay, so here's a picture of the Mexican revolutionaries, uh, Pancho Villa and Francisco Madero. Or Francisco Madero. Um, Pancho Villa we'll talk about here in a little bit, but Francisco Madero is the guy who ended up getting arrested and went against um, Diaz. So revolution grows. Um, Madero was kind of unprepared for a revolution. He was just running for president. Uh, so the lack of land reforms led to open rebellion because people wanted land. So then two guys who are probably the biggest names out of the revolution are Emiliano Zapata, whose entire like motto was land and liberty, and then Pancho Villa. Okay. Um, those two guys, Zapata and Villa, have people who follow them called Zapatistas and Villistas. Okay. So those are the two largest groups during the revolution. You'll see that here in a little bit. Um, Madero was actually overthrown by General Victoriano Huerta in 1913, and Madero was actually eventually assassinated. Um, people were not happy with the job he was doing as president because he wasn't doing the things that they thought he was going to do when he overthrew Diaz. So 
so here's a map of the revolution. Um, if you look at the different people down here, you can notice there's a bunch of different things going on, a bunch of different people re revolting, a bunch of different campaigns. There's no real organization to it, which is kind of the downfall of the Mexican Revolution. Um, they weren't unified in their goals and what they wanted to do, which ended up being why it took so long for them to actually get anywhere with the revolution. Okay. So after Huerta became the president, a few years later, he gets overthrown by this group of Carranza, Obregón, Villa, and Zapata. Okay, so they all join together, and this is kind of where they do get a little bit of organization. They join together and they overthrow Huerta. So they overthrow Huerta in 1914. Um, Carranza, people like him better, um, and he helps implement the Mexican Constitution in 1917. Villa and Zapata continue to rebel because they aren't quite satisfied with what's going on. They end up finishing up rebelling around 1919 and 1920. And then Carranza actually gets thrown, overthrown in 1920 by Obregón. So you see a lot of kind of backbiting here, back and forth, because each person has a different agenda and their agenda isn't quite getting completed or fulfilled. So here's the timeline. The top part I'm not focused on as much. Um, those are all the different events that we just talked about. But the bottom part it gives you a really good visual of like, okay, you had Diaz as, as president and then people started opposing him. Like Madera said, overthrow him. So he becomes president. The Zapatistas and the Villistas come in and they start opposing Madera. They get over, Madera gets overthrown. Huerta becomes president. Then you have Carranza, the Zapatistas, the Villistas, everybody opposing Huerta. Huerta gets overthrown. Carranza becomes president. The only people who are kind of consistent through all this are the Zapatistas and Villistas. They oppose everybody pretty much for the whole thing, whereas everybody else just kind of, when they get power, they're there for a little bit and they get overthrown again. So women during the revolution, um, they're more of the intellectuals. They call for equal rights. They call for women's suffrage and other reforms. Um, if you think about this time period, this is also when women got the right to vote, such as that's what suffrage is um, here in the US. So it was a movement that was going on in Mexico as well. Um, they often endured threats, imprisonment. Um, they were soldaderas, and soldaderas is a cognate, it means soldiers, female soldiers. Um, they served as nurses, cooks, forged for food, washed clothes, and then they actually also served in, especially like the rebel armies. Um, and I'll show you that in just a second. So here are some of the pictures of them. If you've ever watched The Book of Life, uh, there are the two cousins in there who say they fought in the revolution, and they're dressed similar to what these women are dressed. Um, so yeah, they served. Aftermath of the revolution, uh, over a million people died. Um, like we said earlier, the revolution kind of like a plan. It was kind of all over the place. The organization wasn't there. So then you end up having a lot of drawn out backstabbing. And so there being one unified goal. Um, farming, ranching, and mining pretty much destroyed because at that point they were all kind of owned by the government or by very large private owners. Um, the oil industry actually improved during this because of the rev uh, because of the industrial revolution and things growing in that sense. But who do you think suffered the most from the revolution? And why do you think that? So you've pretty much got it. Um, if you were thinking everybody, pretty much, um, but the criollos were probably the ones who suffered the most because they had the most to lose. They were the ones in power. Um, but the people who were suffering before and then throughout this were the mestizos or the indios. They were already sitting there with nothing, no land, very little money. Um, so they were the ones who suffered pretty much throughout the entire thing. Although the criollos are the ones who got their stuff destroyed. And then as you see later on, things start kind of leveling out a little bit, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, instantly, no major bank or newspaper survived the revolution. So no institutions kind of made it out of this. The Constitution of 1917 confers crown powers to the president, a basis for land reform. Um, there was no major land giveaways until 1934. So they didn't see the fruits of their labor for quite a while. Um, 
the government retained ownership of mineral and water sources. They didn't pass any labor laws until really like 1931. There were some that came out of the Constitution in 1917, but, but not a lot. Um, and then it also placed restrictions on the church and clergy. And this is, we'll talk about it now. So here's the aftermath. Obregón ended up becoming the president in 1920. He ended up building schools and encouraging nationalism, which is just pride in your country. Um, Mexico becomes a single party system. Here in the US, we have a two party system. They have a one party system. Um, and I want you to think of like, what kind of system does the US use, which I just told you, and then which do you think is better, ours or the Mexico's or the US's? And then after Obregón, um, a couple years later, you have Lázaro Cárdenas, who actually redistributed 45 million acres of land, so he had a huge land giveaway. And then since then, up until about 1984, they've had 253 million acres given away. Um, that's a lot of land. Uh, and then he also promoted economic nationalism. So he made it where the railroads and the oil were nationalized, meaning the government took them all. Um, so. Y'all probably wondering why we're doing the Mexican Revolution. First of all, like I said earlier, today is um, the anniversary of the Mexican Revolution, but also what, how does this compare to our culture and our history? What do we have in common that's similar to the Mexican Revolution? And that's what we'll be working on tomorrow when you're getting your smart groups. So, adios.